and yet we fail to pray as we should. And failing to pray means we're missing out on this intimate communion that we have with God the Father. And maybe we don't pray because our previous prayers have not been answered. A few days before my mother's death, you know, Sally and I sat down to pray with her and she said, well, a lot of good that's done. Been very cynical. There's sometimes that prayers don't seem to be answered and, and so we strive, we wanna know, we wanna know that our prayers are answered. We don't wanna know that our prayers are heard And if we pray and our prayers aren't answered, that can give us a crisis of faith. We say, okay, like my mother said, a lot of good that's done. I want to give you an exception to be prayers being heard. Prayers aren't heard unless you're a child of God. Unless you belong to the family of God. And the only exception to that is that first prayer you make, Lord, I'm a sinner, I repent, and I submit to Lord Jesus in my life. When we read of the Gospels, read of the coming to Christ, he says, you just got to believe. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, I'll believe. I'll believe Jesus lived. And that's an intellectual ascension. Remember in our study of Mark, it was two years ago now, the first chapter in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. Those are the only two qualifications you need to become a Christian is to repent and believe. Doesn't say anything about a prayer accepting Christ as your Savior. See, you can't have a Savior without having a Lord. And believing means that your behavior will reflect what you believe. You believe that that speed limit sign on the highway says speed limit 55, and you adjust, more or less, you adjust your behavior according to that speed limit sign. And you are even more diligent in adjusting your behavior if you see a car with lights on the top, right? And if you're under the lordship of Jesus, you seek to act as he would have you. Your behavior is a reflection, I said, of what you believe. Professing Jesus as your Savior is not the same as confessing your sins and submitting to Jesus as your Lord. And every kingdom has a king, and the Christian's king is the triune God. We saw that in the Gospels that prayer was a part of Jesus' existence. In Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. If you recall that account, everybody was looking for him and he's off somewhere praying. And then later in Mark 6, 46, it's written, after leaving them, he went up to mountainside to pray. And then scripture tells us too to be like Jesus. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And just earlier this year, we read in 1 John, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So the point I'm getting at is if the Son of God on this earth found it necessary to pray, how could we not? So we've been examining this prayer of Daniel in chapter 9 to see some characteristics of effective prayer. We know that Daniel was devoted to prayer because he'd rather be eaten alive than give up his prayer life. 
We know that Daniel was righteous. The prophet Ezekiel wrote what God told him, that there was Daniel, Noah, and Job that were righteous. No one in all of history were as righteous as those three. And we know that Daniel's prayers were effective because Gabriel the angel showed up. Before we dig into this, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray during this time that as we look at it and examine it, that it would come into our lives, come into our hearts and our minds, that we'd be able to live it out as we depart this place. Lord, we pray for the one who preaches you to forgive him his sins, for there are many. We are here, Lord, to draw near to you through Jesus Christ and him alone. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've seen in the weeks previous, the first of all, effective prayers in harmony with God's word. We saw that in verse 2, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. He was reading the scriptures when he began praying. We saw that it was grounded in the will of God. He prayed according to what he read, that the desolation, verse 2, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. It was getting to the end of 70 years, or the 60-some years, and Daniel saying, okay, now let's go for it. Lord, have your will be done. And it's important to understand the purpose of that. Prayer is intended to bend our will to that of God's and not bend God's will to ours. It's not so much that we can get things we pray for, it's that we can get in on God's will, that we become participants in His agenda for the world by praying according to His will. We can identify ourselves with God and it causes his, and his causes and his purposes. We saw that it was intentional, verse three. So he turned, I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer. He was focused, he fasted in preparation. We saw last week that prayer was strengthened in confession. And basically confession is to say the same thing that God is stating about our sin, right? agreeing with God that our sin is our sin. And true prayer enters the presence of God with a sense of God's absolute holiness and our unholiness and calls it as it is. And understanding as well that the only reason that we can come before the throne, as I said in a prayer, is through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Confession is a preparation of the heart prior to our request, our prayer requests. And you see that in verse 5, verse 6, verse 8, verse 10. We have not obeyed the Lord our God and kept the laws he gave us. The other thing confession does, it allows or frees God... In our mind, it frees God to chasten us without inequity. We're not the impudent child sitting there. What was that for? Why did you do that? We understood what happened. We have to admit that it was our fault, that we've offended God. The next characteristic of God's prayer is that it's dependent upon God's character. First one is God is omnipotent. Verse 4, look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God. How pointless would it be to pray to a lump of wood carved in the image of a horse? How pointless is it to worship that television, your favorite football team, whatever the case may be? a God that has no power. God has all the resources at his disposal with the wisdom to be able to use them. Another characteristic of God is that he's righteous. 
He's free of sin or guilt in nature, attitude, action, and word. He's the ultimate lawgiver. He sets a standard of what is right. Look at verse 7. Lord, you are righteous in 14b, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. And then God is just. There's some of you here old enough to remember television shows in the late 70s. Spoiler alert, there were only three networks at the time, guys. So there was a great commonality in what we watched. And there was this TV show called Beretta. Remember the show Beretta? Tony Blake, he's an undercover cop. His favorite saying was, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. God is just. And there's sometimes we just say, well, Lord, it's not fair. It's not just. Folks, we don't want justice. If things were just, we'd be in hell at this moment. Justice demands that there's a penalty for any infraction of God's law. Look at verse 11. All of Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Here it is. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. And then skip down to 14. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we've not obeyed him. Daniel's saying, hey, we brought this on ourselves. We own up to it. And then God is merciful. Verse 9, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. Verse 16, O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Verse 16b, our sins and our inequities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Then to 18b, we do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. You understand what mercy is, right? Not getting what we deserve. If you were due a spanking and you didn't get a spanking, your parent showed you mercy. Or as you're older and you were speeding, you got pulled over and you didn't get a ticket, that was mercy. So not only is effective prayer in harmony with God's word, it's grounded in the will of God, it's intentional, it's strengthened in confession, it depends on God's character, it consummates in God's glory. Verse 16, now now our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Verse 17, now our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servants. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. I'm copying and pasting that twice, sorry about that. Verse 18, give ear, O Lord, and hear, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Verse 19, O Lord, listen, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O Lord, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Saying, don't do it for, don't do it for us, Lord, do it for you. Do it for your name. Your name is associated with Jerusalem and your people, and, and everybody around us sees that you've allowed Babylon to destroy us. Not good, good for your public relations, Lord. Daniel says, we've sinned, we brought, we brought the reproach, and, and we've corrupted your name, and that's not fair. And, and turn that around, Lord. Give us mercy, restore us back, that it would glorify your name. Forgive us and restore us the virtue and holiness and the majesty of your name in the eyes of the world. We bear your name. 
all, all prayer, all creation is to glorify God. It's as if someone said to God, say, you cannot create a creature that has free will, that will love you, that will be obedient to you without force. God says, you want to bet? He created us with free will. We can choose to follow God. We can choose not to follow God. There are consequences to either choice. But he created a way that a creature with free will would love him, would be obedient. And that way he created was through Jesus Christ. Well, let's close here. We want, I want, to look, want you to turn to John chapter 17. I think it's page 1070 in your pew Bible. 1070. Here's a prayer of Jesus. It's called the High Priestly Prayer in some of your Bibles. Jesus says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might get etern give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence and with the glory I had before you the world began. Verse 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They are yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Verse 8, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and, and glory has come to me through them. Skip down to 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. And my prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Remember, remember that passage. We're not of this world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Verse 20 here is a really important one. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. Folks, Jesus has prayed for everybody here that has chosen to follow him. That was a little bit before you're all born, too, you know. He knew you were coming. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one as we are in one. Down to 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory and the glory you have given me before you loved me before the creation of the world. There's some promises there, folks. That first of all, Jesus has prayed for us and Jesus wants us to be in his presence. Prayer is important. You think about that. Amen.